praise and glory. And we're excited about all that God is doing. And everything that, well, we got a new preacher in the house. Yeah. Hey, Amen. <laughs> all right, that's great. <coughs> As most of you know, this has been a very um, tumultuous day for some uh, in different areas of our country. But how many of you uh, have made up your mind that in this new year, you're not going to have tumultuous days? You're going to have days that are given and dedicated unto God. And um, the more I look at the Word of God, the more excited I get uh, to knowing that He's on His way back, and there ain't nothing that can keep Him from the appointed time. Man can't, government can't, armies can't, nations can't, nobody can. And he's got an appointed time, and so do you and I. And uh, I'm telling you, it, it's uh, in midst of everything. These are these are probably the most exciting days that we could be living in. Hallelujah! Uh, I mean, we are on the threshold of our Lord returning, and I'm telling you, you don't get no better than that. It's what we've been living for. Uh, we've been living so we can live and live eternally. Uh, you know, there, there was a, a, a song we, we a song we used to sing years ago, and uh, there was a lady who sang it all the time, and you'd had to know her name was Vera Herring, and Vera's done gone on to be at the Lord many years ago, and she had a real high voice, and I mean, it was really high, a voice of Jeremy's, <laughs> and, and uh, she would sing a song, and she always sang the same special song every, pretty much every Sunday night. And the song went, I'll never die, just be promoted. Amen. And how about that? Isn't, isn't that a powerful yes. song? I'll never die, I'm just going to get promoted to my mansion in the sky, okay? And I won't try to sing it, I promise you. But anyhow, uh, you're going to get promoted. Amen. And the promotion's not too far off. Uh, let's all stand. We're going to go to the Lord and ask Him to be with us tonight. And we're just so grateful all of, all of you are here tonight and... Uh, we're glad uh, more are, are finding their way back and coming back, um, and we're just so so thankful. Danny, good to see you again. Bobby, so good to see you tonight, uh, and just all of you. It's good to see all of you tonight, and we're just very excited about what God is doing, and we give him all the praise and the glory. So let's all just bow our head. Father, I thank you for this evening. I thank you for the power of the cross of Calvary. I thank you, Lord, for the deity of whom you are. You are God, and there is no other, and there is none like unto you. Man may have all of his idols and all the deities he wants, but when it comes down to the Word of God, the Word says that you and you alone are God Almighty. And Father, what power that is to know that we serve an almighty risen Savior who is none other than God. And Father, we just ask tonight that you would be with us and you would bless us in our service tonight, God. Bless our young people tonight, Lord, as they uh, receive the word, God. We ask that you'd be with our children tonight, God. And Father, we pray, Lord, that those that might be sick in body tonight, God, that you would just raise them up, God, right now. Just raise them up wherever they're at. Lord, all the prayer requests that come in, Lord, raise them up. Heal the bodies in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, the same word for salvation is the same word for healing. All done by your power and by your grace, Lord. Father, so I thank you, God, for what you're doing tonight. And Lord, I ask God that you'd receive our praise and worship. We come to you, Lord, God, full of our heart. And Lord, just wanting to express our love and our gratitude to you. So Lord, we give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory. And the body of Christ said, Amen. 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 Let's worship Amen. God. Hallelujah. Lord, uh, Pastor, I'm uh, reminded when you said that we're going to get promoted. Yes. What would be a better promotion than, than uh, taking our last breath would just be like Enoch. We're just walking there. Yes, we yeah, are with him. Amen. Yeah. Come on. So, well, soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon.
his name. Thank you, Brother Kenny. All right, tonight we're just going to worship the Lord, and we're going to continue into the Word of God tonight, and uh, we're very excited about all that God's doing. And uh, so we're going to let our young people be dismissed, our children, and the adults will be out here, and we're just going to get into the Word of God tonight. Thank you, praise team. Appreciate you all very much. I owe you a couple steak dinners.
Amen. 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 You know, there was a time we would have been very happy to have about 50 people here. And now when we have 50 people, it looks like we're empty. <laughs> uh, but we're glad that you're here tonight. And we, I am really excited about all that God's doing and different ones that's been uh, calling us and texting us and saying, you know, we're feeling so much better and we're, uh, we're getting ready to come back. And, and I, I, I'm very grateful for that. And... Uh, how many of you have made up your mind that you're not going to live by the world standards? I'm not going to live by the world standards. Um, I'm just I'm going to live by faith. And a matter of fact, Sunday morning we're going to be talking a whole about faith that was bought, brought to you and I and bought by the precious blood of Jesus. For the next, uh, hopefully the next four or five weeks, we're going to be talking about the blood, but we're going to talk about different aspects of what the blood made available for you and I. And uh, I believe that uh, the Lord will bless in a very real way. Uh, last week, we started talking about the deity of Jesus. And the, one of the reasons that, uh, boy, I'm telling you, I, I believe with all my heart, uh, what we have been preaching for the last several months has really been prophetic. Um, not only about the return of the Lord, about the rise of a one-world religious system, uh, and just about everything uh, that we've been talking about for the last several months, we're watching it every day in the news right now. Uh, God is bringing to pass His Word. And um, last week we talked to you about um, the deity of Christ. Uh, and people would say, well, that's a doctrinal thing, and why is it so important? Well, if you don't understand and realize that you serve a Savior who has risen and conquered the grave, and you don't realize that He is God made flesh, then see, you're believing in something subpar. You're believing in man, a religious system, or you're believing in maybe a, even a false god. So we began to look at different ways people see God. Because, see, a lot of times I could be sitting here talking to you and I can ask you uh, a question. Dave, I can say, do you know uh, James? And you'll look at me and you'll go like, well, yeah, I know James. Uh, James is uh, about six foot four or three, somewhere in that ballpark. He's got gray hair, six foot two. All right, uh, I'm embellishing it for you. <laughs> All right, uh, he's got gray hair, and um, you know, nice guy. Well, but that's not that's not the James that I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about another James that lives in Idaho, and he's uh, a little shorter, uh, a little bit bigger around. He's got black curly hair. So what's the point of that? A lot of times we can be talking about someone, James, Jesus. But we can be talking about two totally complete individuals. They're not the same. Right? But when we start talking to people, well, do you know Jesus? Yeah, I know Jesus. I've known Jesus most all of my life. All right? But do you really know Jesus? Because, see, the Jesus I'm talking about may not be the one that you're thinking of. Because, see, you may be thinking just of a Jesus that you learned about in Sunday school. But I'm talking about Jesus who is a risen Lord and a risen Savior is coming back for you and I again. 
You may be thinking about a Jesus who uh, doesn't really uh, still heal today through his power or his blood. I'm talking about a Jesus that all sin has been eliminated because of his blood. Healing is available to us because of his blood. So we can be referring to the same person, but completely talking about someone who is totally, absolutely different. So somebody knocks on my door, and uh, I answer the door, and uh, they try to get me to donate a couple of quarters or a dollar for a magazine. And I don't need the magazine. I've got the Bible. I've got the Word of God, all right? And then we'll get into a little bit of a discussion, and I'll say, well, I believe in Jesus Christ. Well, I do too, they'll tell me. Well, I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, I do too. But... What their understanding of Jesus and the Holy Spirit and my understanding of Jesus and the Holy Spirit are two totally different things, amen? And we talked about that a little bit because, see, some say that he is just a created being and he's just a a little bit uh, higher than the angels, but he was a created being. How many of you realize that the Jesus that we're talking about was not a created being, but the Jesus we're talking about is one who created all of the beings in the heavens and the earth, amen? Different Jesus. Some would knock on my door, others, and they'd knock on my door, and they would tell me, do you understand how Jesus visited America uh, during the time that he was in the grave? And I'll say, well, uh, that's up for debate, (laughs) okay? And uh, I'll say, you know, do you believe in Jesus? And they'll say, yes, I believe in Jesus. But see, it's not the same Jesus, Because the Jesus that they believe in is a Jesus who basically ultimately did enough good and got into a high enough rank that he became a god. And also, not only did he become a god, but he is the brother of Lucifer. All right? Am I right? I'm right. See? Same name, Jesus, but a whole different person, all right, of what Others say that they believe when they tell me they believe in Jesus Christ. I remember one knocked on my door one time, and and, uh, we were talking, and uh, we talked about the Holy Spirit, and he said, well, I don't believe uh, in all of that tongue talking. And he says, matter of fact, you can't talk in tongues right now, even if you wanted to. And I just go, he ought to mahashikat, I ought Yes, I can too, all right? Absolutely. How can you do that? Because the Bible says the Spirit has given you the utterance. When did he give you the utterance? The moment that you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit when you knelt down and you began to pray and you asked for it. And it's up to you and I to release that tongue and that gift. And you can do it whenever you desire to do it, if you desire to do it. Nancy does it all the time when she's in her prayer. She'll be praying and all of a sudden she just decides to go into her prayer language. So what I'm trying to share with you, there's a lot of different views of who Christ is. Well, some say he was a a prophet. He was one of the many prophets. Uh, Of the thousands of prophets, he was one of them. And in their, their book, the Quran, it will even refer to Jesus Christ. But there'll be no place where it will have to say, Uh, that they will admit that he is the almighty divine son of God. Because, see, they cannot comprehend how Jesus can be God the Father and God the Son. Well, that's physically impossible. And they will get pretty graphic in, in explaining to you how that's physically impossible. But how many of you know the Scripture says that without God, all things are possible? Listen, I've never, heard, I've never heard a donkey talk. But if you could ask Balaam, Balaam would tell you that donkey talked, <laughs> all right? And that donkey told me what I could not do. I could not put a curse on Israel anymore. It's a lot of things. So what, who, what Jesus are you believing in? What Jesus, when we sit down with our friends and they just tell us, oh, yeah, 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 I I believe in Jesus too. But what Jesus do they believe in? 
See, Jesus made some really powerful statements. Do you remember in Genesis in the early uh, part of the chapter when God was dealing with Abraham? And Abraham was up on the mountain and there was a, a, a bush that caught on fire. And uh, uh, God said, take off your shoes for you're on holy ground. And when Moses approached and he, God says, go back and tell the people, I am. Well, who do I tell that they sent me? You tell them that I am. Now, how many of you realize that was God speaking, wasn't it? And he says, I am. Now, how many of you realize that when Jesus in the book of John stood before the council and they were asking him and they were talking to him about uh, by what authority and by what right and by what power uh, are you doing what you're doing and, and are you really the king and uh, as you proclaim to be? And he simply just looked at them and he says, I am. I am. As a matter of fact, before Abraham was, I am. Now, isn't it amazing that we don't want to, many times people don't want to equate Jesus as being God, but yet Jesus himself will use the same very phrase referring to himself as God did when he was referring to himself. God says, you tell him, I am sent you. Jesus says, I am, and before Abraham was, I am. So I want you to realize, what was he saying? He is saying, I and my Father are one. John 17, he talks about it. When you see me, you see my Father. When you see my Father, you see me. And the works that I do, I do because of my Father, amen? And everything I've said, everything I've done, uh, I've done it because it's what my Father told me to do. It's what I heard my Father say. It's what I saw my Father do. How in the world could he have saw what the father did? He was with him. See, when Nahum dipped down in the water seven times, Jesus was there. He watched him dip seven times. All the miracles that we hear in the Old Testament or see in the Old Testament, Jesus was there. He was right there. He was God incarnate and made flesh. So there's no question about what the Word of God says about Jesus. He's God. Now, why is that important? Because, see, sometimes in the religious world, we can get so religious that when we pray, we're not really praying to God. We're praying to something that we've learned about or someone we've learned about, and we've allowed the world to dilute it. Amen. Well, I've got to be politically correct. A woman. It is sad where we're going. As a matter of fact, I'm going to put it in a different way. It's sad where we are. Not just where we're heading, but where we are. All right. So, I'm sorry, I can't refer to God as a woman. And, I, and that's not a sexist statement. The Bible says he is our what? Our heavenly father. Jesus said when you pray, you pray as this way. Our father which is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So we go according to the word of God and not according to man's standard. So I'm asking tonight, who Jesus are you worshiping? And well, who, whose Jesus are you believing in? What did the early church fathers say about him? Now, most of the early church fathers, we don't talk a lot about in church, and, and that's really to our detriment, all right? Because, see, they were the closest to the actual time that Jesus walked on earth. And some of them would be the bishops that will follow men like the Apostle Paul at the church at Antioch, all right? So these, these men were really, really close. So here's what you do. If I want to have more faith and confidence in something, then I'm going to look to that one that was closest to the teacher. I'm not going to necessarily put all of my faith in a disciple of 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 a disciple. The further away you get from the original source, the more apt you are to have discrepancies and 
mistruths. But the closer you are to the source, all right, the odds are you've got a better idea of what's happening and what's going on and a little bit better grasp of the truth. Someone can say, well, I just kind of think it went this way. Hey, you weren't there, so you don't know how, what way it went. Some of these guys were there almost at the very beginning. They have a greater understanding of what the early church believed in. So what did these early church fathers believe? Let me begin to start. There was a, Ignatius was a martyr between 98 and 117. He was the third bishop of Antioch. And in his writings to the Ephesians, the Romans, and the Sumerians, he referred to Jesus, or the Smyrnians, from Smyrna, we'll just put it that way, all right? Uh, he referred to Jesus as God in his writings. So listen to what he's saying. And we're talking somewhere in the neighborhood of right around maybe 50, 60 years after the death of Christ. Pretty close, Okay. Here we are, well over 2,000 years past it. These guys were relatively close. What, what did he say? Jesus Christ, our God. For our God, Jesus the Christ. God appeared in the likeness of man. Our great God, Jesus. These are the phrases that are found in his writings. I give glory to Jesus Christ, the God who bestowed wisdom upon you, the blood of Christ who is God. Now, if I ask you a simple question right now uh, of the early church father Ignatius, what would, what would your answer be if I say, what was his view of Jesus? He was what? Did he leave any doubt? He's God. So here's one of the very early church fathers who says, this Jesus that we're preaching and this Jesus that, that died just about 50, 60 years ago, I want you to realize he's God. Why was it important? Because the same thing that is happening today happened then. The world began to creep in. Uh, the Nicolaitans began to creep in. And what was the great battles? Two battles that were dominated. First of all was the battle of the difference between a being a Jew and a Gentile. If you were a Gentile, you had to fulfill the law that the Jew did or you couldn't really truly be saved. Paul spends an enormous amount of time and a lot of books in that he wrote dealing with this issue. What is the other thing that he, you deal with? In the book of Colossians, Paul deals with the deity of Jesus Christ. Everything that was made was made by him. Nothing that is was not made that it had not been made by Jesus Christ. Amen. Upon him, everything in our being is held together by who? Jesus Christ. He was trying to help the early church understand the deity and the power of who they serve. We are in a lukewarm church at best. We really don't know if he is the true God that can heal, that can deliver, that can set free, that can save the world, that can change our community, or if he's just a figure of speech that the church has learned to use and turn to. I know I'm getting pretty close to the skin here, ain't I? And until we understand who he really is, you'll never understand the fullness of his power. See, I don't understand. I can talk to a young kid today and, and I can say, hey, listen, uh, you know, I had this muscle car back in the 70s, you know, and it had a 440, uh, you know, and it had a four-speed transmission, and, and I can give all the details, and I knew what it was to go down the highway, and when not, not too many people were on the highway, punch it. I knew what it would do, okay? It would sit down in the backside, and it would squall for a while, and then it would be like a can of, and away you would go. Another person can get in it. A little, someone can just get in, and they go to spring market. All right? And to them, that's all that it is. 
I got all of this power, and why would I want to relegate it to spring market? I want to use it. But if you don't know what's there, odds are you're never going to punch it. And that's where we are in the church today. We're afraid to really punch it. What, what did the prophet say unto God when Elijah said, Lord God, I've done everything that I know to do, and everything I've done, I've done at, at, at your will and by your bidding. I've done according to your word. Now answer by fire. Well, we don't do that. Why? Because we've not done everything by his will and at his bidding. So we're afraid. What are we afraid of? We're afraid he won't answer. And then equally as bad, we're afraid we'll look like an idiot. And that generally keeps us from punching it. We're afraid of what we're going to end up looking like. Well, look at a couple of the other church fathers. I hope this resonates with you. Polycarp lived between 70 and 155 AD. A disciple of the Apostle John. He was a bishop at Smyrna. He writes, our Lord and God, Jesus Christ. Now, he puts it together. He is our Lord, and he's our God. Who is your Lord, and who is your God? Jesus Christ. So many were coming into the church in the early days uh, during their time frame and even in Paul's time, and they were trying to simply say that this body, now here, let me explain it to you. And if I get it wrong, Jeff, let me know, please. This body is a sinful place, all right? It is full of corruption. It's full of deceit. It's full of lust. That's this body. The God in heaven could never, ever agree to come into this world and God, who is God of the universe, the pure God, the God of all love, the God of infancy, the God of compassion, and a God who would know no sin could never come down into this world and come into a defiled body that we are in the flesh. Therefore, when he came into this world, he didn't come into this world as God. He chose Jesus basically to come into this world in a manger. Others will pick up on it and say, well, yeah, but when he was baptized and the Holy Spirit came upon him, that's when he became God. No, he's always been God. He is God. He always will be God. Amen? He's God to the Hebrew children. Oh, you don't remember that old song? Come on now. He's always God. He's God and he always will be. So, this battle is, is, is rampant. And you know what? 2,000 years later, we're still fighting the same battle. He's a good man. He's a good prophet, but he's not God. He's a good teacher, but he's not God. He's a good religious leader, but he's not God. That's contrary to what the Bible says about who he is, what he says he is, and even what the early church fathers said. Let's go on just a little bit further. Arrhenius, who lived between 130 and 202 A.D., a disciple of Polycarp and a bishop at the present-day Lyons in France. He is himself in his own right God and Lord and eternal King and only begotten and the incarnate Word. Our Lord and our God and Savior, and King. Did you know Jesus is the only one that came into this world as a Savior? Do you know the Christian faith is the only faith that offers you a Savior? Do you hear me? It's the only faith that offers you a Savior. Now, I could 
pray to all kinds of gods, but they are not going to save me. That's not their purpose. As a matter of fact, all the idols and all the false gods in this world, you serve them. You idolize them. You worship them. But when we look at Jesus, he says, I didn't come in the world to be served, but I'd rather I came to serve. And I came to be your savior and set you free from sin. What a difference in the Jesus that you and I serve. It's powerful. So he's our Lord. He's our, he's our God. He's our Savior. Who? Jesus Christ. We go on a little bit further. Justice Martyr is where the term martyr comes from. He was the, one of the first Christian who would die as he died as a martyr. Here's what he says of Jesus. He says, being the first begotten word of God is even God. Christ, both God and the Lord of hosts. Now, is there any question? I got a couple more of these fathers. I want to, but why? Because I'm trying to help under you to understand God through the scriptures. All the scripture says he's God. The early church father said he was God. Jesus himself says, I am that I am. He's God. So when you begin to pray, I want you to know who you're praying to. You're not praying to a name. You're not praying to an idea or a concept or a principle. You're praying to a real, undeniable concept that God is Christ Jesus. Jesus is God. Now, that's all made distinct through the Trinity, but at the same time, he's God. Clements of Alexandria, truly most manifest deity, he that is made equal to the Lord of the universe, because he was his son. Tertullian said, the only man who is without sin is Christ, for Christ is also God. Origen who was one of the most distinguished of the early church fathers, said, we worship one God, the Father and the Son. Christianity has been accused of being a polytheistic uh, religion because they say we worship three gods. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Moses said that uh, we are to worship only one God, all right? Monotheism, all right? That's where the Jews separate with the believers of Christianity. That's where Islam separates one of the areas that they separate with you and I. But if you understand, we serve one God. But we serve that one God who has made manifest himself by the power of the Holy Spirit. That is God's power and the the Son who came to make a living sacrifice for you and I, and the Father, the creator of the universe, through that trinity, that triune God, we serve one God. The early church fathers had no question about it. They, they had no misconceptions. This is God that we're serving. This Jesus Christ is none other than God. So when you pray, understand you're praying to God. You're not praying to man. You're not praying to an idol. You're praying to God. And nothing is impossible with God. God says, I'll hear every prayer that you pray. I'll answer every prayer that you ask me. I'll watch every tear that falls from your face. I'll hear every cry that comes off your lip. Why? I am God. I'm God. For some reason that slips so much of the church today. We would nowhere near be in the situations that we're in today if we truly understood that there is only one God and one Lord, we wouldn't be where we are today because we know what God said. So let's go just a little bit further. Now let's look at some of what Jesus said. Revelations 22, 12, and 13, and behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me. I am the Alpha, the Omega, I am the beginning, I am the end, and I am the first, and I am the last. Wait a minute. 
There's no room for anybody else in there. There's no more room. I'm going to come quickly, and my reward is with me. Alpha, omega, the beginning, the end, the first and the last. If you're interested in who's speaking that, you look at verse 16, I, Jesus. Jesus said, I'm the first and the last. Wasn't what John was writing about him. <laughs> he says, I am the first and the last. Revelation 1 8, I am the Alpha and I am the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord. Now, all of the scripture says he is what? God, our Lord. And he's the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. Now, listen to what the scripture says in Revelation 1 8, I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who, who is to come. I am the what? Almighty. Almighty, I want your prayers answered in 2021. I want you healed in 2021. I want your homes restored in 2021. I want your families to come to the cross of Calvary in this coming year. And you say, well, I don't know if it can be done. If we understand that we pray to God, the creator of the universe, and the one who made salvation available to you and I, why would it not be possible for all those things to become a reality? He's God. I said he is God. I'm not here to preach touchy-feely good stuff. There's too many places around here that preach it. And it's all they care about, making you feel good. I don't want to rock your world, but it'll keep you out of hell. I'll rock it every day if I have to. Listen. Jesus referred to himself. I, I shared this with him, but let me give you the scripture verses. John 8, 58 through 59, Jesus said unto them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to throw against him. They wanted to kill him. Why? Because he was healing people on the Sabbath? No. Why? Because they just didn't like him? No. Why? Because he was interfering with their religious world? No. They wanted to kill him because he claimed to be God. And see, the Old Testament is emphatic about there being no other deity except God the Father. And here Jesus comes and says, oh, by the way, I am God <laughs> And I could just see their face. They, they had to be livid. Well, they were. They're going to kill him. They're going to pick up stones and throw at him. I am that God. <laughs> you see, you know, and he tells him, so you, you're searching the scriptures. And you're looking for the word, and you're, you're seeking me through the, the word, which would have been the Old Testament at that time, and here I am right in front of your face, and you can't accept me. How many times are we dealing with our friends and our loved ones and our relatives, or maybe you're dealing with it yourself? That you're seeking God, you're seeking help, you're seeking deliverance, and God says, I'm here for you. And like when they answered the door, when Peter knocked on the door and said, I'm here. Oh, you can't. Go away. We're praying for Peter to get released out of prison. Hello, don't you get it? They didn't understand the power of their prayer. <laughs> Do you understand the power of your prayer? Listen, if you're praying to Jesus, there's more power in that prayer and all the positive confessions you can make in a lifetime. Did you hear me? Well, yeah, but you got to say it. Yes, you got to say it. 
Whatsoever things you believe in your heart and you say it with your mouth shall be yours. So why don't you simply say it? Jesus, I come to you in the name, in your name, Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus, and you know what my needs are, and you're God, and there's nothing impossible with you. Am I speaking it? I'm spe- am I speaking it? I'm speaking it, aren't I? So if I believe it in my heart that he really is God, that's why this teaching is so important. If I believe in my heart he truly is God Almighty, and he has all power and all authority, and I come to him in prayer and I speak it out, his name, and I speak out what it is, then why should I not absolutely firmly believe that I'll have what I say? I should Well, you don't know my son and daughter. No, but God does. But you don't know my living situation. No, I don't, but God does. See, we fail to realize that. We fail to realize that God knows everything about us. Everything. And that that can be scary sometimes. So Jesus refers to himself. The passage is significant because Jesus was using the same name that God used of himself in the Old Testament, Exodus 3.14. And God said to Moses, "Who I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say unto the children of Israel, I am that sent you. John 10, 31 and 33. Then the Jews took up stone again to stone him. The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we will not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself God. For that, we're going, to, we're going to get the big rocks. And we're going to stone you because of who you think you are. <laughs> that ain't who he thought he was. It's who he was. All right? There's two differences. Some of us here tonight, we may think we're one thing, but God says, no, I know who you really are. Jesus knew who he really was. Hmm. Jesus claimed to be equal with the Father. Now, we're talking about God, okay? Therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only spoke, broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his Father, making himself equal to God. Well, we'll kill you because you're God, or you say you're God, Now we're going to kill you because you say you're equal to God. But in Philippians chapter 2, the scripture Mark you're referring to, that scripture says he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So either he was who he said he was or he was really deluded. He was on the crazy side. To stand before all of the, the Jewish council and say, you know what? Me and my father are one. We're equal. Because he knew that would lead them to want to stone him to death. So either he was crazy and out of his mind, and he had a death wish, or, guess what? He was God. (laughs) He was God. Oh, hallelujah. Glory. I can preach this all night long. The Jews understood exactly what Jesus was asserting and that he was claiming to be deity. John 1.18 says, No one has seen the God, the Father, at any time, the only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father. He has declared him. Hebrews 1, chapter, uh, verses 2 and 3. God has in these last days spoken to us by his Son whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Everything that's made is made by me. Paul tells us that, as I said earlier, in Colossians. And now we're, the writer of Hebrews is saying the very same thing. I'm challenging you to understand who it is you believe in. 
See, it's not good enough just to have an experience here on a Sunday morning. It's not good enough just to, you know, I'm saved, glory, hallelujah, I'm on my way to heaven. No, on your way to heaven, you're going to encounter a lot of people that are lost without Jesus and don't have an understanding of who Christ really is. And it's our responsibility to lead them and teach them and guide them into a relationship with the living Savior, Jesus Christ, so they will not perish eternally. That's our responsibility. Jesus is the ultimate revelation of God. John 12, 44 says, Then Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. But see, you've got to believe the Father. If you believe in me, you've got to believe the Father. If you believe in the Father, you've got to believe in me, because guess what? We're the same. I'm God made flesh. See, if it was a man, Jesus, that died on the cross for you and I, guess what? It's a man. You know how many men have willingly laid their life down for another? Matter of fact, the scripture says that no greater love have a man than he would lay down his life for his brother. Do you know how many men throwed their bodies on a grenade in the foxhole during the wars? How many have stepped in front of a bullet to protect somebody and it cost them their life? They gave the ultimate sacrifice, but none of that would guarantee them heaven, all right? It will not get you to heaven. Do you understand me? It won't get you there. But God said, I have come and I have laid down my life that you might have life and that you might have life to the fullest or in an abundance. I am God, and I'm willing to lay my life down for you that you might have life. Man can do it all day long for one another, but it will not buy salvation. The only one that could blot away our sin, why he was spotless. As a sin offering, he was spotless. When they brought in the heifer and uh, to be burnt, when they brought in the sacrifices to be given unto God uh, on the altar, uh, the priest would have to open up the uh, belly and they would have to go inside. They'd have to feel every one of the organs. They would have to feel through the intestines and everything. Why? Because there could not be any kind of a tumor. There couldn't be any scar tissue. There couldn't be any kind of blemish whatsoever. And they generally wanted a firstborn male in order to be sacrificed upon the altar, unblemished. That's why Zechariah later on will say, God's got something against you. You've thrown the truth in the street. Hello, we've thrown the truth in the streets today, all right? And, and you've offered unto me sacrifices that are blemished. You're not giving me your best. Well, I could preach right here and I could stay here for hours. You're not giving me your best. You give me your leftovers. You give me, you give me that sacrifice that's been blemished. Jesus said, when I come, I am an unblemished, is what Hebrew says. He's unblemished sacrifice offered upon for you and I once and for all. That's why Jesus had to be sinless. That's why I don't care what all the modern political correct people say. Well, Jesus probably, uh, you know, ran around with Mary or there was all kinds of stuff. Surely he sinned somewhere along the road. No, if he had sinned, he could not have been a spotless, unblemished sacrifice for you and I. But he lived a sinless life in order to be that sacrifice for you and I. it took me four months to get through Revelations, and if I got to Hebrews, it'd probably take me eight. The Father's unlimited power is revealed in Jesus. John 3, 2 says unto Nicodemus, came, Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. 
For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Uh. Now, there's, there's, there's a revelation there. No one can do all these signs and wonders unless God is there with them. Now, maybe, maybe the reason we're not seeing what we want to see is maybe the God and the Jesus that we're believing in is, is not God. Maybe he's just what we've heard about or, or a name that we've attached ourselves to because I live in America, so I'm a Christian. I'm not a Muslim. I'm not a Hindu. I'm not a Buddhist. Therefore, I'm a Christian. And Jesus is the kind of the leader of our, our group or our sect. Well, listen, if you're praying to that Jesus alone and you're not believing that he's God then th that power of God's not with you. And you lay hands on people all you want. Ain't nothing going to happen. But if you understand that God is with you and God is in you, oh, hallelujah, then you can believe God for the supernatural and you'll see miracles begin to happen and take place. They knew that. They knew that what you're doing can't be done by man. It's got to be God. You can't raise the dead unless God's there to do it. You can't open a blind eye. Listen, you can be blind. I can come up here and spit all over you and poke fingers in you and try to get your eyeballs to see again. But if God ain't with me, guess what? I'm going to have soaking eyeballs, all right? And they ain't going to smell too good. But if I know God is with me, And I believe in the true God, and he's right there. Didn't he take up habitation in your and our life when we called upon him? So then he's there. So then if I know that he's right there, and I believe that he's God, and that he created the universe, he can do all things, then why can't I believe God for a miracle for somebody that I'm praying for? Why? Why can't I? <clears throat> Well, if they just had more faith, they ain't got nothing to do about their faith. I'm tired of hearing that. <laughs> That's just an excuse. I'm getting looks now. <clears throat> All right, they got no faith. See, I, I've never understood it. I've been in countries in different foreign lands that were Buddhists and Muslims and Hindus, and they don't believe in God. Some of them never heard God. But I look at them and I say, you know what? If you'll believe God, God will heal you. And they go, I believe God. And the blind eyes are open. The crutches are gone. The wheelchairs are gone. Uh, tumors fall off. And every manner of miracle begins to take place. And then, what kind of faith did they have? John, they didn't know nothing about faith. They knew nothing about Jesus. Now I'm going to hit you hard. Yeah, they did. Papa Gill talked to you about how uh, he had a, a, a young boy come into one of his meetings, didn't have an arm, and uh, he called that guy up, and uh, that young man went up, and, and Papa Gill began to pray for him, and next thing you know, boom, boy, everything came out. A little finger started growing out of, of, of the socket up here. And a little bit later, the arm come out a little bit, and all of a sudden, a little bit later, the whole arm just popped right out of his shoulder. Didn't know that that young boy's dad was the chief of the village. Well, guess what? Who, who do you think was in church the next night? And people began to give their heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. God's not changed. He's God. Has been, is, always will be. And the stories like that are endless. Is it um, Dickie Osborne, uh, is it Dixie? I think her name was Dixie Osborne, T.L. Osborne's wife. They were holding a mass crusade in India. And someone had said something about T.L. Osborne being a faith healer and uh, was kind of pointing toward him. So he asked his wife to come up. He said, well, I'll let, I'll let my wife come up here. And if, I've got, if I re recall, the, recall the account correctly, she came up and said something to the effect that 
tomorrow night, or I think she said tomorrow night, if you are blind, you bring everybody else with you. We want all the blind people here. And our God, like Elijah, our God is going to heal every blind eye that comes here tomorrow night. Oh, now either, either he is or he ain't. All right. Came forward. Every blind eye was open that night. The altar was full. Oh. I believe that some of our forefathers had a true understanding of who Jesus really was. And it wasn't because of my preaching or anybody's preaching. Uh, Forefathers, it wouldn't have been my preaching, would it? It wasn't because of preaching. Because they had a divine revelation of who Christ was. That's what we're lacking. We're lacking a true divine revelation of who Jesus Christ really is. He's God. A few more scriptures. I want to share with you. He's the father of infinite wisdom is revealed. The father's infinite wisdom is revealed in Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.24 But to those who are called, both Jew and Greek, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. (laughs) Let's put the scriptures. If any man lack wisdom, do what? Let him ask, and what will happen? He will be given wisdom, and it will be what? Abundance, but the Scripture says it will be, which ultimately is the same, it will be unabridged. It won't be cliff notes. <laughs> All right, It won't be just a little here and a little bit. Haley, when you ask God for wisdom, he said, if you lack it, you ask him for it, and he will give it to you totally. He'll not hold anything back from you. Now, that's the wisdom of God. It's given to us by God, because why? Christ has all wisdom. So here's what I want us to begin to try to learn how to do. He has all wisdom. He has all power. He's all-knowing. He's God. He's everywhere. You can't confuse him, all right? And everybody in this room can stand up right now, and we can all start praying out loud. Some pray in tongues, some pray not in tongues. And we can always, we can yell, we can scream, we can pray quietly, and we can pray silently. Guess what? You'll never confuse God. He'll hear every one of them. And he'll know exactly what you're praying about and what you're asking. So, If Jesus is God, we've received Jesus as our Lord and Savior. He's come into our life, and he resides within us. So when you're going through a situation and you need a little wisdom, where do you think you should turn? Definitely not CNN. Turn to God. God, I don't know what to do. Okay, be still, be quiet. And I'm going to tell you what to do. Now, if you don't like it, I'm still going to tell you what to do. And once I tell you what to do, it's up to you to do it. That's where we make our mistake. That's where we make the mistake. But Lord, I'm going to pray for this individual, but I just don't have the power. No, I know you don't. The power resides in me. But that power, because I am in you, then that power is at work in you as well. Why? Because I reside inside of you. So now you have that power that resides in you to believe God for the miracle. The Father's endless love is revealed and demonstrated in Christ. 1 John 3.16 says, By this we know love, because he laid down his life. You and I. Woo, glory to God. Man. 
one of the most powerful ones that we talked about last week. I'll not go into a lot of details. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. Ah, it's amazing. I'm God. How in the world can we ever fathom God leaving heaven and coming down into this world and sacrificing himself for us? Beyond my comprehension. So what do I do then? I walk by faith. I walk by faith in the Word of God. I believe God's Word. I believe what He said. And I walk by faith in His Word, and I listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit on the inside. And if that voice on the inside ever contradicts the Word, guess what? I go to the Word. Okay? Go to the Word. Now, that's just, that's just the way it is. Mark 1.38, Jesus said to them, Let us go into the next town that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. i got to read that again, because this is what we got to do this next year. we got to get off our backside. Mark 1.38 said, Jesus said unto them, Let us go to the next town that I may preach there also because for this purpose I have come forth. I'm not expecting you to come to me tomorrow and say, Pastor Paul, God told me to move to the next town. (laughs) Because if you do, I'm going to talk to you about Joseph being blooming where he was planted. Planted here, bloom here. All right? What was he saying? He said, people need me. They need to be reconciled to my father. That's the reason I came. One of the, another problem that we have in the church, if we're not careful of, we forgot about the word, go. And what's that mean, go? I have a different concept because, see, I've went a lot of places. I've been a lot of places. I've seen a lot of places, a lot of things around the world. And said, I've been blessed and favored of God to do that. But to go simply means to put action behind what you believe. So going is is all around you. It's your friends, it's your neighbor, it's your family, it's your loved one, it's your community, it's your state, it's your nation, it's the world. It's the idea of people need Jesus. And they're not going to receive him unless somebody tells them. How can you believe except you hear? And how can you hear except someone take the message and be a preacher? You're the preacher. Don't ever come up to me and say, gee, I think I'm called of God. When can I start? Where can I pastor a church? You're a preacher. That's a street corner. And once all this junk gets over with, there's prison ministries, and there's there's so many places to preach the gospel of Jesus. Unbelievable. Kids preach it at school. They'll be intimidated. I promise you one thing. Our teenagers start preaching Jesus at school. Something's going to happen. There was a prophetic word that Nancy saw this morning. It was kind of interesting. He said, there's a generation right now that are, what, how did that go? That God was getting ready to skip a generation. All right, how many is 30 and under? All right, girls, go. (laughs) And there you are. All right, I'll give you a Bible on the way out. (laughs) What's saying? Saying that the, this world needs to be reached, and a lot of people have just become complacent. A lot feel that their time of ministry is over with, which I don't believe that. 
okay? But God, it will raise up a generation. Uh, it will be accomplished one way or the other. Well, I'm going to close. I got a lot more notes there, but I think, I think I've got my message across. My message simply is that we've got to believe who Christ really is. We've got to believe in his deity, that he's Jesus. Now, there was a time where I didn't think that would be a big issue in the spirit-filled church today. But boy, what I've been seeing in the last year or two, it's becoming a bigger, bigger issue than I ever dreamed it would have been. Unbelievable. When the congressman or senator, whichever one he was, prayed what he prayed, praying to all the different deities, recognizing all the different deities and different religions, what an abomination. What an abomination. Should never have happened in our nation. Ever. Not by someone who considers himself a minister or a preacher of the gospel, pastoring of a church, but we're being saturated. And I have a hard time, now I, I, and I can be wrong, and I'll admit that right up front. I can be wrong. I have a hard time believing that I can support same-sex marriage, abortions, um, legalized uh, gender changing, and I mean, all of the stuff, and then stand behind the pulpit and say, I believe in the deity of Christ. I don't know how you can do that, because all of that is contrary to who Jesus really is in the Word. So they could tell me they believe in Jesus, but it's not the Jesus I understand from the Bible. So, yep, someone totally different. So listen, I, here's what I'm telling you. As much as we can, our church is going to stand on the truth of the Word of God. I know that that probably will bring some, uh, you know, name-calling or whatever. Listen, I spent four... I, I spent four years in the Navy, so there's probably no name you can call me. I ain't been called. <laughs> All right. I mean that. <laughs> All right. All right. I mean, I learned, I learned from the first day I went in the Navy, I was no more than a maggot. <laughs> and, and it went from there downhill. <laughs> that was a good name. <laughs> so we're, we're going to be accused of stuff, okay? Don't worry about it. Know who you serve. And I promise those who rebuke you, revile you, call you the worst, will be the very ones in time of need that's going to call you and ask you for prayer. That's, Marty, that's just how it is. And they'll ask you for prayer. Pray for them. Bring them to church. <clears throat> well, they don't like to go to church. Bring them to church. It's a place of fellowship. It's a place to where we care about you and we love you. Doesn't mean we don't make mistakes. We all make mistakes. Come on, good gracious. You got to understand that. There's something about fellowship that can't be replaced in the world. Can't do it. Can't do it. I hear people tell me all the time, uh, well, yeah, I had a buddy at my bar, in the bars and they did more for me than that. No. Most of the ones that I ever met in a bar, the only time they were next to me is when I was buying the next round. And there might have been a few who would have stuck through me through thick and thin. But when I was really down, and when everything was gone, it was my brothers and sisters in Christ who stuck with me, prayed for me. Didn't mean they came and saw me every time I sneezed. They were there, I knew their prayers were there, and they got me through. So 
That's what we do. That's what we're about. Look down. I hope you got something tonight. Let's all stand. Second Sunday dinner, uh, Sunday. Looking forward to that. So uh, everybody, it's been a long time, so everybody pack up the food. And uh, we're going to have a great time in the Lord. So make plans to be there. If you got other things on the agenda, and unless it's going to shake heaven and earth, be at the dinner. Be at church Sunday. I believe the message is going to be uh, really timely. And uh, we're going to give God praise and glory for it. And um, or bring something good to eat. That's right. That's right. Most everybody will. Who? Huh. Well, we'll keep on asking. All right. All right. Amen. Amen. Well, skip dismisses in prayer, would you?